Welcome to the IYCN panel discussion for World Nature Conservation Day. It's our pleasure to have a, I have some very, very incredible speakers. First of all, we have with us uh, Pasana Ganguly. She is the officer in charge, Rite of Passage Wildlife Trust of India. Then we have Mr. Ranku Sangma, who was who is the chief forest officer, forest department, Gado Hills Autonomous District Council. We have Dr. Marak, who is the project officer, Pygmy Hog Conservation Program, Dural Wildlife Conservation Trust. And we have Raka Sangma, the president of IYCN. So here are the, the, the rules as such for today's panel discussion is that uh, each speaker will speak for about around 15 minutes. We will take questions at the end. And if any of you have questions that uh, come to you later, etc., please write into us and we will forward those questions to the speakers. So here we go. Raka, let's start with you. I request Raka to share a few words on World Nature Conservation Day. Hi everyone, am I audible? Yes, sir. Okay, you are. Uh, yeah. So, uh, thank you, everyone. I thank the speakers who are here today, who have made time from their busy schedules to be here and be with a youth network who is operating and advocating for environmental justice and climate justice. And today, uh, the World Nature Conservation Day. Uh, we are going to look into one of the success stories of a community-led uh, conservation project in Garo Hills, which has become a huge success. And personally, it has been one of the most inspiring projects that I have ever known, that I have come across. And the people involved in this conservation are also equally inspiring, inspiring hardworking, and I believe that the presentations, the message that they are going to send out today are going to be equally inspiring and going to inspire a lot more young people like how it has inspired me in the past. And without further ado, let's move on ahead with the uh, panel discussion. All right. I request uh, Upasana to to take the stage. So it will. Uh, Upasana, we can't uh, we can't hear you. I think you're on uh, mute from your side. Hello. Yeah, now, you're, now, we, now we can hear you. Yeah. Yeah. OK. So hi, everyone. Good evening. Thank you for inviting me to this panel. Thank you, Raka. And uh, I have met Raka sometime in 2016, I guess, since he visited our project site once. So yeah, I mean, I'm very happy to come here and you know speak to you about a project which is very close to my heart personally also. Uh, a project which we at Wildlife Trust of India, we have worked for close to two decades now. And um, I just have a few slides to uh, share with you to just show the beauty of the Garo Hills. Uh, just a second. Yeah, can you see my screen? Yeah, we can. Okay. So yeah, I mean, this is, this is, um, shot from the Nokrit National Park. And uh, if you can see the beautiful forests here. So the Garo Hills in the state of Meghalaya, it has an incredibly rich biodiversity. I mean, it, uh, the flora of the state, close to 40% of the flora there is endemic. And uh, there are a lot of uh, important mammals, endemic mammals, bird species of reptiles, amphibians, and fish species and which is also very vital for the forest-based communities that inhabit that region. 
And interestingly, this habitat is part of the Indo-Burmese biodiversity hotspot, which is also unfortunately among the most threatened biodiversity hotspots on Earth. And um, this particular landscape also has around 1,200 to 1,500 elephants, which have been a flagship species for our project. Another interesting thing about this area is uh, there is a national park there called the Nokrek National Park. And the area uh, around that is also a citrus gene bank, which many people don't know. That is, there are wild species of citrus which are found in these beautiful forests. So all this actually makes these areas incredibly rich in biodiversity. Uh, these are just some of the um, animals which we find in these forests. The Western Hulog Gibbon, the Asian elephant, the Marseille fish, and uh, that's a photo of the citrus in the wild in one of the community forests there. You can see my slide transition, right? Yes, we can, we can. Okay, okay. So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, this, this, is a, this is the beauty of this, la uh, this uh, landscape, but it is equally threatened, as I told you. There is this issue, the major problem being the shifting cultivation, the slash and burn cultivation, or the zoom cultivation, as you call it. You can see in this image, there are forests in the background and there is zoom cultivation in the foreground. So the, uh, the environmental impact of, the, of this kind of cultivation owes more to the diminishing duration of the fallow period over the years than to the activity itself. So the, so the fact that the reduced fallow cycles in this landscape, which has been triggered by the population growth, which has happened in the last few decades, means that the regeneration of secondary forest is constantly interrupted by crop plantation. And this has actually become a challenge in terms of forest management, both by the State Forest Department and the Garo Autonomous Council. So now why this is a matter of concern, you may ask, because this is like a subsistence for them, right? Now, if you can see on vast swathes of the hill, the forest somehow struggles to reassert itself. Now, there are tree stumps everywhere. Now, for, imagine for a species like the Western Hulog Gibbon, the loss of the canopy connectivity. So the canopy connectivity is extremely important for these the species to survive. So if there is no, if there's loss of connectivity, it means that there is isolation from food or water sources. And the choice between certain starvation in the tree canopy, and if they come to the ground, there is a possible predation by dogs uh, and other animals on the ground. For the thousand odd elephants which survive in this landscape, the disruption of the connectivity or the corridors which we call for elephants means there is forced movement through human use areas. And these are some usual scenes which happens when elephants move through the human settlement. Um, so they come into contact with people and there is possibility of conflict, which is a serious concern in India today as close to 500 humans they are killed annually and close to 100 elephants are on average die annually because of human elephant conflict. So this was a matter of concern and this sort of formed the base for our work to start there from Wildlife Trust of India. If I show you the landscape map, it will become a bit clearer. This entire landscape of Garo Hills is actually part of the Nighalia elephant landscape. It includes the Garo Hills Elephant Reserve, which is spread across 3,500 square kilometer. There are two main protected areas in this landscape, if you can see, the Nokrik National Park and the Balpakram National Park. So the Nokrik Peak from the Nokrik Peak, actually, it's the highest point in these hills. You can see the burden vertebrae of the complete Garo Hills here. And somewhere in the east is the another ecological crown jewel of this landscape, which is, which is the Balpakram National Park. So when we say Garo Green Spine, so this entire landscape connecting Nokrik to Balfakram actually forms the backbone of biodiversity of this region. And that's how the name came up, the Garo Green Spine. So this is like a, the, the green spine of this area. Um, so yeah, I mean, this, this complete landscape, it allows for unhindered movement of elephants and other canopy connectivities of gibbons and many, many other important species. And um, if you can see, um, these small, small forests, these are all separated by community lands. Now, these all come under the forest department in terms of the state forest department there. 
to their protected areas like the bifurcan and there are smaller ones like the cg violence center and then these are connected by five elephant corridors which are shown in the pink arrow now uh, we we have been running a project in wildlife trust of india for close to two decades now which is the right of passage project which is actually identified 101 elephant corridors functional elephant corridors across the country we have surveyed each one of them we have prepared a detailed map for each one of them and prepared a conservation action plan uh, for each one of them so when we started this project the, these five corridors were part of those uh, corridors which oh, country wide corridors which we had surveyed now here there is a unique very unique uh, uh, model here because it, it's very different from uh, many parts of the india but similar to quite quite a few parts of northeast india the main aim when we started the project was to see how we can join these these isolated patches of forest which are the protected areas and that's how the garu green spine conservation project was conceived so we over the time what happened is um, we also developed few models on how we can secure these corridors and one of them was the community based securement model now you may ask that jhum is a part of their cultural heritage right it's also a way they exert their rights and control over the land so how do you balance this with conservation one of the most remarkable things when we started was that despite the dependence on such agricultural practices which is crucial for the core sustenance of these tribes the garo community they have taken it upon themselves to stitch together this fine through their participation and contribution to the community led conservation initiative which we started and that's exactly what gave us a platform or i would say a leverage to initiate the project in the early 2000s one of the most interesting things about this landscape landscape is only 7 to 8% of the forest area in the entire landscape is under the control of the state that is the meghalaya forest state state forest department the complete other part of the area the remaining area is owned by the local communities which comes under the jurisdiction and management of the garo hills autonomous district council uh, there is this, there is this there is this fixed schedule uh, in the constitution of india which provides the tribal people of northeast india a role in planning and development of the area which is free of any external influences or pressures and is in complete accordance with their traditions and needs and what personally i have observed is i mean i was completely when i first visited garo in 2015 and i got to know about this entire system they have it's remarkable they have a system even at the village level uh, they have the village head who's called the nakma they have a very very specific very systematic way of land distribution so the village headmen the nakma they decide how much land every family member should get every year for cultivation how much land they should keep aside for forest so they already had a system in place and it was just you know us as a partnership going together be it by let trust of india or the garo council or the state forest department going there and providing a technical assistance to them to take this forward and how we did it was actually a five objectives a five pronged approach which we uh, and deployed one was to have this concept of creating villages or forests now uh, these people already had some community forests in their areas which they were protecting because they understand the importance of forest protection they understand that their survival for their survival it is crucial that they protect forests that they protect water because a lot of these forest areas are important catchment areas as well so we uh, started Uh, working with the community, which was the only way to uh, do this, we started our dialogue with the community. We had a series of consultative meetings with the village members, and they had these community lands called the Akin land. And um, so, uh, when we started this, we got to uh, got to understand what was the problem they were facing in their village. How we can, you know, jointly work together to see that. uh even some of their needs are supported and in the process there is some forest protection also happens so then this model of village is of forest scheme so every every village through every village then which we work with they have actually entered into an agreement to set aside certain area of land from their community forests and declare it as villages of forest 
Now, how we choose those forest patches is basically exactly in a way that that connectivity which I showed you earlier. So it's exactly in that way that we select certain potential sites which are important for connectivity, then move to these uh, people, discuss this, and jointly uh, create these village reserve forests. And it comes under the management of the Gala Hills Autonomous Council. And once the village people design uh, the agreement, there are certain guidelines which we follow that they will not cultivate in that particular patch of forest or they will not change the land use. So it's, it's a remarkable system in place which has worked beautifully for the last uh, 20 years now. So while doing this, it is also very important that you establish a bilateral benefit sharing model because the community who is uh, giving up their land for conservation, it's our responsibility also to see if some sort of support could be provided to them. So generally, the kind of support which we have um, given over the years is basically related to their needs. Uh, we do a thorough socioeconomic survey in each of the villages we work with. We identify their needs, what the village is lacking, what they uh, are, what are the immediate needs. So stuff like medical health camps or just like you know building a bridge in their village so that they, their children can go to school when this river swells up otherwise they could have you know two months they would have lost not going to a school or not access to the medical health centers or building sanitation facilities to avoid open defecation or any other important things like solar lanterns or tv any kind of community support which the people need to uh, enhance a bit of their livelihood and lifestyle. So th th there was this model of bilateral benefit sharing, uh, which was established through uh, the working with the community. Another important aspect was while we were declaring village reserve forests, there were certain left fallow lands from Chom, which were degraded patches, which were equally important for us to restore uh, if we have to build on that connectivity. So this was very important. This has been a very important component of our project where we also see how we can reforest the open degraded patches um, through plantation work and assisted natural regeneration where we protect the existing plants and <laughs> let them uh, flourish. So close to 250 hectares of forest land have been restored. And the beautiful thing is all the people, all the, all the community members of the villages we work with, they are themselves involved. So, this is not just a way to restore forests, but it's also a way for them to earn a little bit of livelihood. So this is a boost for their livelihood also if they are themselves involved in this entire process. It's also very important simultaneously to assess the biodiversity because you are protecting forests. So it's also important to monitor uh, uh, what, uh, what kind of biodiversity these forests have. So that was another approach we've, uh, we've used over the years. And we have now a team of close to 20 village watchers. So these are all people from the village. We have trained them on, uh, they receive nature guide trainings. They know how to identify birds. They know how to do a dung encounter survey for elephants. They, they, are, they are watchers in the sense that they monitor the uh, village reserve forests also to see what kind of biodiversity are there on a regular basis. And they also keep an eye if anybody is uh, going and doing anything in the VRF. You know, for example, a couple of years back, our watcher he found out that one of the villagers they were growing cardamom saplings inside a village of their forest. So they got to know who that is, and then they had a meeting at the community level, and those plant saplings were removed, and that person, that family, was made to issue a public apology. So the community is very tight knit in that sense that they understand the value of forest which they have protected and they're extremely protective about it as well. And the fifth approach which we have um, uh, used is to awareness and promotion of their cultural heritage, which is very important because somewhere down the line, the young people of their community, they are losing touch with certain, uh, certain elements of their cultural heritage. So we try then bring back. Uh, we try to bring back that element as much as possible through the project. Like if you can see, this is the Hundred Drums Wangala Festival we have every year. So we try and organize these festivals. And um, football is of course a very um, in entertainment source of entertainment for these people. So wherever they have requested, we've also renovated some football grounds so that there is uh, this thing with community bonding which can come through. We 
two years back, we organized the Kajiata, which is our nationwide campaign on elephant corridors protection. We did this in Meghalaya. Uh, this campaign, it was like a, uh, like a journey of the elephant. It passed from one corridor to another and covered the entire landscape from right from Nokrit to Balsakram. And uh, children were engaged, community members were engaged. So it's just a validation of the fact that they're already doing so much for uh, conservation. So how do we just, you know, uh, promote that? And of course, wall paintings in schools have also been a very important tool to spread the message for conservation. So these were more or less the five approaches which we have used in the last uh, last 18 years or so to get this done. And we're very happy that there are close to now 3,000 hectares of land which we have secured through this entire uh, process. And two elephant corridors have been secured. We are working in another one and another one at the location. And there are 17 villages of forest which have been created, close to 250 hectares of degraded forest habitats which are um, being restored. So I think, I think it's been a beautiful um, uh, collaboration with the Wildlife Trust of India, Garo Health Autonomous Council, the local community. And I just want to end my presentation saying, while the role of all of us, say us or the council, it has been extremely laudatory, we have only acted as catalysts and the entire credit goes to the local community because they have always been conservation oriented. They know their lives and livelihoods are completely dependent on forests and the community has taken it upon itself to stitch together this landscape. So we, we are just there to provide some technical guidance. And this example also acts as a very pioneering step for other district councils in Northeast India, other autonomous councils, other tribal councils which are there in other parts of Northeast India, or people who, are, uh, who have these community lands in other parts of India as well can actually learn from this example. The Wildlife Protection Act also recognizes the power of local community uh, and having all these community reserves as an option of protection of land. So, and this project, as I, if I would sum up, is um, an affirmation of the indigenous self rights, self government, and community empowerment, which has created a multi level impact, not just for wildlife protection, but also a positive social impact for the community with regard to their lifestyle and livelihood. And I feel that empowering communities and working with them is the big step towards sustainable environment protection in the long term. Thank you. Thank you, Upasana. That was a brilliant presentation. Now I'd like to welcome our next speaker, Dr. Marak. Dr. Marak, can you hear us? Uh, yeah, hello. Hi, Dr. Marak. Can you hear can me? You hear yes, yeah. yes, yes. Yeah. So I, I am going you. to. Okay. Perfect. Please carry on, Dr. Marak. So, like, uh, thank you all. Thank you, all the organizers and all the attendees. Thank you, Upasana, for beautiful presentation. And uh, since Upasana has covered almost uh, all the important aspects about what they are doing out there, and regarding the land rights, which the Constitution of India has bestowed upon us by sixth schedule of Indian Constitution. And as far as that sixth schedule of Indian Constitution, the elected MDCs or member of district council, they have the legislative powers over land, forest, water, uh, shifting cultivation, or you can say zoom cultivation, village administration, uh, inheritance of property, as we know, like uh, we Garo, we belong to matrilineal society and other customs, other social customs, so to say, like uh, our MDCs, they can make a law. So like uh, 
they have the legislative power over these things. And they also have the legislative power and uh, other power over allotment of land other than reserve forest, which they can allot, which uh, they don't have power over for the purpose of agriculture or non-agriculture or uh, other residential or like uh, developmental activities. And uh, management of any forest other than reserve forest is also regulated by Garohes District Autonomous Council. And before I talk about the other things, let me begin with the basics. So when we talk about the conservation and other works relating to conservation, it's always about the people and the environment. See, our daily life is linked to environment. We depend completely on nature for sustaining our life. We depend on nature for clean air, water, land, food, and stable climate. That is the most important thing. But our selfish and greedy activities are having an increasing harmful effect on wildlife ecosystem. It's putting not just wild species, but our own survival at risk. And we all know environment always gives back what we give to him or her. We can call him, I mean, like we can call it mother nature, so we can address it uh, as her. So like, uh, you know, our activities has always contributed to the uh, pollution of land, water, and air. And when we talk about water, there are many different sources of water like river, lakes, streams, oceans, and seas. So you can look at any of these source. You'll always find the pollution. And one of the most important factor contributing to the pollution of water bodies are plastic. And when we talk about pollution, it contributes to the climate change through global warming. And when there is a climate change, it causes many natural disasters like hurricanes, tornadoes, storms, or you can say tsunamis, floods, landslides, rock slides, and mudslides. It results in many dead and destruction of properties. And uh, because of global warming, there is a rise in sea level, water sea level. Then uh, when we talk about the climate change, we should always connect it to our environment. And because of the change in climate or natural calamities, there are uh, many, many refugees, which is, uh, which are like uh, going from one place to another place. Say, for example, like uh, we can just uh, in generally, we can talk about, say, a group of people coming from one country to another country, say, suppose like, uh, they came to our country and they got settled in one place, which is designated as refugee camp by the government. And for establishing these refugee camps, they'll be using our forest resources, like uh, timbers and bamboos and other forest resources. And uh, whether you like it or not, they will be engaging in illegal activities like hunting and poaching, which will result in habitat destruction. And this kind of 
habitat destruction all around the world will push the thousands of species of plants and animals to the brink of extinction. So from all these points, we can come down to a single point that is the importance of community or importance of humans in the field of conservation. So when we talk about the importance of engaging community in community work, I would generally like to talk about many uh, developing and underdeveloped countries which have limited income opportunities. So local communities are mostly dependent on forest resources for their livelihood. So we should always think that in order to have a successful conservation project, we should find a balance between the wild habitat and the land for maintaining the livelihoods of the people around the wildlife sanctuaries, reserve forests, or national parks. And we should also make sure that uh, the project site should represent the community voices by following the democratic processes. And we should encourage the communities to build the institutions. And when we talk about building the institutions, it means the capacity building. We should encourage the communities and we should help them rather in establishing institutions like uh, Upasana was uh, talking about, they are engaging communities in many uh, different activities, which will uplift their socioeconomic conditions like weaving, handloom, handicrafts, woodcrafts, and there are many other activities, be it like agricultural, horticultural or animal husbandry aspect or ecotourism. There are so many different ways where we can train them and we can en encourage them to do those kind of activities so that they won't be depending on forest resources. They won't be going inside the forest for the need of their daily use. So, when we talk about community engagement, uh, community people, they should be allowed to define their rules and regulations locally, uh, which uh, is in accordance with the legislation of state and central government. And uh, community always has a very good understanding of forests and wildlife, since for quite a long time, from the time of their ancestors, they're living near to the forest and wildlife. So they can give you a good information regarding the importance of wildlife and indigenous trees. And when you talk about curbing the illegal activities like hunting and poaching, community can always help us in giving us the information so that we can identify those hunters, those poachers, and we can go and talk with them and we can encourage them to go for different livelihood programs, different trainings, and we can always engage them in a good way so that they won't be depending on forest resources and they won't be depending on illegal activities. And when we talk about community engagement, one thing we should remember is that communities always need financial stability. The people of the any given wildlife sanctuary, reserve forest, or 
national parks. As a conservationist worker, we should always focus on their financial stability, like by what means we can give them the stability so that they won't be engaged in any other activities. And we should encourage them towards the sustainable development, sustainable agroforestry, agriculture, and many other sustainable things. And rather we can focus on sustainable energy generations. Maybe like we can engage them or like we can help them in acquiring many different technologies which will help us in getting the sustainable energy generation. So when we talk about community, it is always difficult to work with them and it takes time, energy, and uh, I should say like 80% of the hard work of uh, uh, conservation workers goes to the community work. It's always easy to work with the animals or wild animals, but it's very difficult to work with the community. So we as a community should always come forward and help the Garo Spine project of uh, WTI and uh, World Land Trust, which is uh, partnering with GHADC. And we as a community have a many big role to play. We have a very big role to play and uh, we, as a community, should always come forward to help them. And like Upashana was uh, talking about and showing us the map, which connects the Nokrek National Park to Balpakram National Park. And in between, there is community lands. So like she was mentioning, most of the lands belong to the community, it belongs to the clan, and it is under the Nokma or clansmen, and there is a gap which uh, they are trying to connect and which uh, they are trying to protect. And when we say about spine, I think they, they call it spine because uh, that, that's like a spine. That's one of the most important uh, stretch of forest, Indo-Burmese forest or Indo-Burmese uh, biodiversity hotspots, you can say. And I think like there should be many things on which uh, we should be working on, like uh, Upasana was talking about human animal conflict and when we talk about human animal conflict it's mostly human elephant conflict and uh, she said they have linked many elephant corridors they have linked village treasure forest with uh, state treasure forest and the main aim of uh, this project i think I'm not sure, is uh, to create many village treasure forests through which they can connect these two biodiversity hotspots of Garo Hills. And these are the most important forest, uh, uh, forest land of our region and uh, one of the most important source of uh, our major rivers, which give us clean water and it helped us in many of our agricultural activities. And when we talk about jum cultivation, I think uh, that's the most uh, 
important thing that's the most uh, significant contributor to the deforestation of our forest but one thing like uh, we should understand is that we should always engage the communities we should always give them alternative means of livelihood so that they can they can have a financial stability and when we talk about community there are many things which uh, needs to be done and uh, i think if we talk about communities i think it will take a quite long time for me to uh, finish it off so with this points i think i'll just uh, wind off my discussion thank you thank you dr marak so unfortunately mr ranku sangma can't join us because of connectivity issues however he has sent across his message in a video that we will share right now hi everyone a happy world nature conservation day to all first of all uh, thank you for having me here in this program i think it is a great way to get people involved and interested in nature and uh, in conservation so as um, already mentioned earlier the garo hills district council is an autonomous uh, institution which has been created under the provisions of the sixth schedule to the constitution of india the district council forest department has been managing uh, community forests under the provisions of the garo hills district council forest act 1958 here in garo hills we have a unique land tenure system where ownership lies with the communities and because of this we also face very unique and different challenges in governance when we talk of governance by definition governance involves the use of power to make and enforce decisions and when decisions concerning access to uh, the use of resources uh, they invariably affect a large number of stakeholders who have different and often conflicting interests people in garo hills are also largely dependent on forests for their livelihood this all this is in uh, addition to jhum so they need firewood for their kitchen they need timber for building their homes and with the increase in population the increase uh, there is increase in demand for forest resources so many a times people are reluctant to set aside areas for conservation as they fear that uh, they will no longer be allowed access to the resources so how to overcome this problem empower the communities to implement and enforce these government decisions i'm talking in terms of uh, managing their forests in 1976 the garo hills autonomous uh, district council enacted the garo hills autonomous district constitution and management of village forests rules 1976 through this we have been able to empower communities to manage their forests in coordination with the departments and under this uh, this enactment we have also been able to register over uh, 250 village reserves and there are many more uh, applications and many more proposals for uh, registrations uh, in the pipeline uh, for a very long time the role of villagers have largely been limited to that of a labor in uh, forestry project activities they had very little to do with the uh, design of projects on conservation or how these projects would be implemented today in all our community forests uh, all our community reserves it is the villagers themselves who plan and implement the projects for managing their forests the garo hills district council is very fortunate also uh, with regard to the uh, management of these forests to have a very valuable and uh, professional partner like the wildlife trust of india who has been helping us in looking after our forests and environment since very long in fact we have a very long association which uh, dates back two decades in the field of conservation 
uh, with them we have been able to successfully secure over 4000 hectares of important animal habitats which includes five crucial elephant corridors and with their support we have also been able to make an impact on people's lives through initiatives that support uh, livelihoods so uh, we along with uh, this uh, wildlife trust of india make a very good team and i am confident that we will continue this association for many more decades all right that was mr sangma if any of our audience members have questions we are now open to take questions please raise your hand or use the chat window we'll uh, go with deborina lindo she has a question Hi, Deborina, can you hear us? All right, well, let's move on to the next person. I don't think she can hear us. Next is Akshay. Hi Akshay, do you, do you have a question? Okay, Deborina is saying she... All right, Deborina, can you type your uh... Question down in the chat window, and question is how can we go about conserving the environment with the youth dr mara kopasana would you like to answer this question um hi yeah um can you hear me yeah kopasana we can hear you yes yes we can yeah so i think uh, uh that youth has a remarkable role i mean the role they have is unparalleled because both in terms of youth from the community as well as uh, people living in the city people who are there in the community they can do their bit by uh, say getting involved in these things i mean the first step would be to uh, give their time voluntarily as much as possible and um, be involved in certain activities so people who are actually in the urban areas they can do their bit by volunteering with organizations who are working uh, for wildlife conservation and gain some hands on experience uh, by going there and you know going to different places and working with the team in there to learn the techniques how they are doing things to get more aware of things and uh, youth has a lot of access to social media also these days and instead of uh spending too much time on social media by doing things otherwise they can devote some time to talk about this issue and share a uh, uh, share a uh, message uh, regarding these particular issues it is the first first step towards participation is awareness so the more you make people aware the more you engage people the more they will feel interested to actually join join you in this movement and um, at the community level i feel that 
empowering them is very important also or, or, as you as you saw from the example of garo hills the people are already motivated but a lot of a lot of people in in the um, yeah, people who are young and especially people who are getting detached with the cultural heritage which probably dr marak can also explain because he's from that area is they don't understand why certain things are happening the way they are happening because these people have an indigenous knowledge and indigenous way of conservation so bringing back that connect together with the youth is very important and uh, so yeah i mean um, that is what i feel the youth can do and give their time spread the message get involved yeah yeah i would like to add something and therefore miss lingdo so in our state we have a very less uh, wildlife organizations or like wildlife societies or ngos working so to say like uh, when we talk about my region garo hills region I think there is a uh, very few I think to name I know only about uh, wildlife trust of India uh, they are working out there since quite a long time but uh, there are not many wildlife organizations or societies or trusts working in our region like Upasana was saying maybe you can get involved with them or maybe you can start in your own way or maybe like uh, you can uh, at least come to Assam and go for some uh, voluntary activities there are many uh, different wildlife organizations in assam it's not uh, so far from our state maybe you can get engaged with them maybe you can uh, like before really going for a work or something maybe you can uh, attend some workshops they they always uh, organize this kind of workshops so it it will be very good for you to attend such uh, workshops where you'll be meeting many people of uh, uh, like this region and many young people with which you can uh, share your ideas and from uh, from them also like maybe you can at least get some ideas and uh, maybe like at least you'll get to appreciate what they are doing in their own state and like uh, upasana is saying we can always start from our own place there are many uh, things which we can do from our own state like uh, when i was uh, in uh, garo hills like uh, me and our uh, team of young people like we would just uh, gather some information and if we get the information maybe like uh, we would go and rescue some wildlife and inform the wildlife department and if they allow like uh, since I'm a vet myself I would uh, go for a routine checkup and if I find that wild animal to be healthy and strong and fit to be released into the wild so after a few days we just uh, release them back into the wild and uh, there are many uh, government initiatives uh, say uh, nowadays since it's a uh, rainy season their government is a uh, having one mission that is called bamboo mission so like maybe you can go to some uh, district administration people or uh, social forestry people maybe you can organize uh, some of your friends and maybe you can take uh, saplings and go for plantation in your like near your place or like in wherever you're staying so there are many things uh, which you can do but it just need the interest like if you really want to do it then you can do it so uh thank you miss uh, lingdo we can move on to next question the next question is from uh, arun who is uh, asking about how to handle the flood situation in this context of conservation so upasana will would like to go first or like uh, i'll just speak uh i mean i can just add uh, from a point of view of uh, how we are uh, protecting animals in in this flood situation because um, as you know assam and other parts of northeast india have been hit yes. badly uh, by the flood 
and uh, one of the important areas is Kaziranga National Park in Assam. So we have a rescue center there, which is also running for 20 years now, the Center for Wildlife yes. Conservation and Conservation. So uh, along with that team, the Kaziranga National Park authorities and the local volunteers. So there is this very, very um, important connectivity between the Kaziranga National Park and the highlands in the Karbianglong Hills. So during the floods, what happens is all the animals, the elephants, rhinos, deer, and other important animals, they seek higher ground. They have to move from Kaziranga to Karbianglong Hills to escape the flood. And what they have to cross is this busy National Highway 37, which cuts, cuts through the entire corridors area, which actually connects these two landscapes. So in this process, what happens, a lot of animals get displaced and you have to manage the traffic also. You have to control the traffic also because a lot of these animals come on streets. You must have seen visuals, so many visuals going around of tigers getting stranded in human areas or elephants moving uh, moving astray or the rhino video which went viral resting on the side of the highway. So we have a team there um, uh, who actually try and uh, you know, facilitate safe passage to these animals as much as possible in situ. And if there is a need, if an animal is injured, then we bring them to our rescue center, we treat them, and we then uh, release them back to the wild. I mean, that is that is the rescue part of it. But of course, when floods and all happen, it's very, you can't just look at a flood in isolation. It's very important that you secure that connectivity also. Because flood is a natural phenomenon. It's been happening, it's required for the ecosystem of Kaziranga to flourish. So how you actually ensure uh, connectivity so that there is safe passage for animals to escape when the flood hit is also something more at a policy level one needs to look at. Yeah, Dr. Mara, would you like to add? Yeah, and uh, the point Upasana was uh, saying or mentioning is about the passage of animals from lower grounds to higher grounds. And there are, like she has said, many activities going around there to facilitate the safe passage of wild animals. So there, uh, these are the activities, like uh, if interested, uh, youths like Miss Lingdo and others, they can join in with uh, different organizations of Assam and uh, different yeah. uh, organizations from uh, like all over the India and around the world, which is working on that. Maybe like uh, you can always come down and help them. And w when you get the uh, feel experience, you, you have that kind of, uh, you know, that sense of uh, feeling happy and sense of feeling responsible and sense of uh, feeling that maybe that you had done something for the good of our uh, wildlife. So these are some of the opportunities. And during this uh, flood time, there is always a, there is always a, like uh, many activities going around near uh, Kajiranga National Park and other national parks. So you can always uh, check on what you want to do and maybe like, uh, People like Miss uh, Lingdo and others who are interested, they can come and help them, uh, which always uh, requires uh, good manpower. Okay, like uh, we can move on to next question. Yeah, quickly, we have uh, three minutes left. Uh, final yeah. question from Ashish. How to involve our leaders in conservation and ensure their policies remain eco-friendly and sustainable? That's a very tricky question, Ashish. <laughs> Uh, especially okay. in the current context. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, one of the ways which, uh, especially if I talk in uh, the Garu context, is if I, if, if you, if you show, saw my presentation, I showed some of the images of our campaign, uh, Gajiyatra. So there, uh, Mr. James Sangma and Ms. Agatha Sangma, who are the leaders uh, in the in, in the Garu in the Garu he had invited them also. So they were very much part of these campaigns. So these awareness campaigns or the mass sensitization campaigns we have is not just to uh, mobilize public will, but also to mobilize political will. The more, I mean, this is one way you can involve leaders. So they get to know about the work. They get to know the importance of um, uh, doing this. And 
yeah i mean that's really helped us because um, having them on board has helped because one of them is member of parliament so they can be your voice uh, in the in the assembly and they can raise your concerns in their own way so the first step is to ensure that they create policies which are eco friendly or sustainable is to involve them as much as, as much as possible through your activities it takes time it's not easy it's not successful also in many cases you might face challenges i mean not every state is different and you might face that it's easier in some places or it's sometimes it's extremely difficult to influence policy level changes uh, especially in the current context with everything going on around us but yeah i mean those are some ways when one can engage uh, these leaders in campaigns and dialogues and uh, you know panel discussions so they're always up for it so you can understand their mindset also what they can do in their capacity and if, if, i think if you can speak to them uh, make them understand clearly what is the need what are your concerns it can work yeah i would like to add on some yeah uh, some things regarding the policies like when when uh, we talk about policies say like uh, upasana and uh, uh ranku was talking about the six schedule even i myself was talking about the six schedule so six schedule it is the uh six schedule of uh, indian constitution under which provisions like uh, it gives the power of legislature to the mdcs and uh, this is just a small example since we are talking about uh, garwell's uh, perspective so uh, w when we talk about uh, policies it always depend on the leaders that uh, what kind of policy they will be framing like upasana said like uh, yes we can go for uh, many different level of talks many different level of panel discussions and so many other discussions but at the end of the day we as a conservationist or as a community we should uh depend and like uh, it should be within the framework of yeah can you hear me yeah yeah, yeah. dr marak we are yeah. out of time so we'll, uh, we'll okay. take your answer and we'll be sharing it with the live stream on facebook a little later we okay. also have one or two more questions that we'll share with you uh thank you okay. all for attending this was extremely extremely beneficial to everybody else we will be sharing this on facebook later in this evening please write in to us on our social media channels it's ibcn.in on instagram the indian youth climate network on facebook and of course you can tweet to us and write to us at contact at iycn uh contact at iycn.in so thank you all for joining in we hope this was thank uh, you thank you uh, benefit to you and happy world nature conservation day guys everybody all yeah. right happy world conservation all day right. all right all right thank you thank you thank you thank you